my name is Frederick. At the moment, I'm a lead data scientist at a German startup, and I will be presenting a dashboard system for Ice Vision today. Um, first off, a bit uh, what things I will present. I will present two examples at first, uh, showing basically some dashboards, and afterwards I will go a bit more into detail about the whole system behind the dashboards. The dashboards are based on Panel and Boki at the moment. Um, the first example will be just looking at some data, uh, specifically here the fridge data set. We just load the data as normal. And then we create a box record data set. Um, the, every class of data has basically a separate data set class, which is required from the dashboards to consume them. So the dashboard can be generated for nearly all object detection dashboards, you just use the bbox record data set, which takes a list of records and a class map. From that, we can feed it into the object detection data set overview, where we supply the data set we created above, and we can also supply height width to size the dashboard. Every dashboard has a show function which displays the dashboard. For example, here we have four tabs. The first gives us some general information about the data set, like the number of images, number of classes, the classes and their names, the minimum area, maximum area, and so on. Then we get also some class stats. So how many images per class, average number of, of objects per image, and fraction of labels, as well as a short bar plot to visualize the fraction of data. Then next we can have a look at the annotations where we have a class mixing, which basically describes how often do these two objects appear together in an image. So for example, if we look at the milk bottle and the water bottle, we can see that in 60 of the 128 images, the two bottles appear together. Further down here, um, we have a stacked histogram of the objects per image on the x-axis and the counts on the y-axis with the stacking colors being the labels. Um, if you want to hide the legend, you can just double click the plot and then the legend will be hit. And if you hover over it, you can see exactly how many uh, counts of the particular class is present. Then for a bit uh, more advanced introspection, um, this is a 2D histogram, which has different attributes that could be can be chosen for the x-axis and the y-axis. For example, right now, the x-axis is the number of annotations, and the y-axis is the label. Um, because the x-axis is basically a categorical feature, as we only have the four classes, one, two, three, and four, we can say, okay, make the axis categorical, then under the hood, no histogram will be created. Um, and it's basically more like a bar plot um, in two dimensions. 
So as we can see here, we have about 32 images with a water bottle and four annotations. And this basically goes down here. If we want to look at, let's say, the normalized area, of course, you can categorize that, but you can't gather much information from this. Um, so you now we can see how the area is basically distributed among the classes. And if we want to compare rows, we can normalize the rows, which will basically give us the comparability between them and present every uh, or will normalize all the values so that one row sums up to one. And if we need more bins, we can always go for just more bins with the bins option. And if we want to limit the range, we can just use the slider to adjust the range accordingly. So just to see if I understood correctly here, if you go back to, can you go back to 10 bins? Just so it's a little bit easier to yes. see. And then, so what this is saying is that, for example, for can, uh, almost all objects are of the area 0 0.04 normalized. Like half of the objects uh, are on can. It, on can? Yes. Yeah. So you can see that basically cans are quite smaller than the other objects where cartons seems to be the biggest. I see. And if you check X is categorical, what, what happens again? Um, this will take every unique value and basically give, uh, or take the histogram, but just take each individual value and will then show them. As you can see here, there are many values. Here they are all zero, but the can provides some small values here. Ah, okay. Which leads to a stringing of the data. But if you have a categorical feature on the x-axis, like the number of annotations, uh, it makes sense to only set it to, or to set it to categorical. This is easier than have to know exactly how many there are. And then also the, because we are using, uh, uh, or under the hood, a real histogram is calculated. Um, the numbers aren't correct up here. Okay, I see. Makes sense now, the categorical, nice. And yeah, you um, have different options. You can go for the number of annotations, the area, area normalized, B-box ratio, um, and then the min, max uh, values for Y and X. And of course, the width and height of the images. Nice. Thank you. I was wondering if the uh, if we use like the square root of the uh, area, so that would be like the 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 width, a normalized width. Uh, yes. If it would be like uh, helpful to have th that um, measure in the sense that it gives you right away an idea. Okay, the box seems to be like. Uh, uh, 40 by 40 or or 120 by 120 something like that instead of the or on top of the area let's say um what yes um i am not quite sure why um there might be an or i also have the um b box x length and y length so I could okay. just put that in there as well. If okay. that the, makes sense. The downside of that is that you don't have, like, uh, you can have a small 
uh, x like small uh, um, let's say height but uh, a large uh, width but if you take the normalized uh, like uh, width which is uh, the square root of the uh, of the box it gives you a rough idea if how big is that box here but sure this isn't uh, much work this is not very complex as i can mm -hmm. show you later to okay. integrate that but uh, i noted it so i can edit great thanks hey Federico, actually i have another question on the objects per image i'm not sure i understand what this is showing like the um not you mean the... this one uh no like the 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 chart on the uh, but yeah that one yeah, yeah. Ah, okay um so this uh, shows on the x-axis the objects per image so mm -hmm. there are either one two three or four images on the object and the basically the question behind the plot is how are the classes distributed over these values so in the so if, okay, if you hover if you hover like on the of uh, yeah for instance like water bottle water bottle there is okay milk bottle milk bottle there is 19 so right. it means that um there are 19 images in which milk bottle appears uh no in which there are two objects one of which is milk bottle right okay okay Got it. Yeah, I was uh, I was uh, trying to rub my rub my head around this. Okay, great. Thank you. Any further questions about this panel? Uh, I want to make sure. Actually, that's always me. I want to make sure I understand the the, the third one you were showing. Uh, so in this case, for instance, once again, like yeah, that's the you were hovering the. Okay, for example, yeah, thirty there. So it means that. Um, uh, for milk bottle, there are 30 images uh, in which uh, it, uh, no, wait, there are 30 images and with three objects, one of which is milk bottle. Right. So it's okay. basically the same as this plot. So you can okay. see here. Just an um, additional dimension. Yes, this is just, I think it's a bit easier to consume by the eye and you have to think Got less it. if you look at this. Got it, thank you. So next up is the gallery. Um, the gallery has sorting options. Uh, for example, let's go by a number of annotations, drop duplicates. Um, this supplies all the annotations. So basically, if we go here, this is sorted based on the annotations. So this image basically has four annotations, so it would give four data points. And if you enable drop duplicates, basically every image is only counted once and the first value that comes up is taken or the first here, the first, uh, let's, let me switch to make it a bit clearer. Let's say we sort by area. This means we sort by the area of the annotations. If I activate drop duplicates, I basically look, okay, which one is the one with the biggest area or with the smallest area? This is the first image. If I now have another annotation on that image with, let's say the biggest height, um, it wouldn't come up later because I drop all the duplicates. So each image is only shown once. If you deactivate drop duplicates, each image can appear more than once in the gallery. And of course you can set the sorting to descending if you want, or you can just go backwards. So for example, here we order, uh, we sorted the images by the area where the first one is the smallest. Uh, it should be the scan here. And the last one is the one with the biggest area. If we change this up and go to the next image. Okay, that's interesting. 
Oh, because of duplicates, probably. Um, this changed. Okay, this is strange. But it should sort the data. Is so. it sorted by uh, its uh, descent or ascend? Um, by default, it's ascending and if you click the descending button, it will be descending. And and what do you mean by sorting by area? Like with what area exactly? Uh, the area of the annotation. Like the the sum. Like let let's say that the, there are four objects. Like are you going to sum up like the area of the four? Uh, no, it's just the annotation. Uh, let's go back here. Um, basically, it would uh, it takes the one with the smallest area. This would be this one, and then on the next image, it would be this annotation would rank the image as one with the smallest area. Um, okay, so so you're, you're sorting, you're getting the sm the smallest annotation area per image and right. then you're, you're sorting by that so what you mean by by area you mean the smallest area of the annotations across the annotations in the image right okay um but because images can have more than one annotation um you can say okay i only want them in order every image should appear only once and ordered by the area Let's say the um, because this image has three objects on it, we can say, OK, we don't want to drop the duplicates. So now it's all sorted just by the annotations. And this image would basically appear three times. First, when this is in order, then probably the water bottle, because uh, the annotation seems to be a bit smaller than the carton annotation. And then it would later appear a third time when this annotation is the next biggest. Oh, OK. Now, now I understand. Thank you. OK, got it. OK, and last, it's basically just a tabular overview over all the annotations in the data set. Is basically if you want to look for something specific. Um, in Galaxy View, uh, I was wondering what are the different keys that you can sort by? So there's area and number of annotations. Um, the keys are the number of annotations, width and height of the images, the labels, so the class, the area, B box ratio, and B box width and height. Right. So to kind of uh, go along the line that Francesco was asking earlier, is it possible to also sort by uh, the sum of areas of all annotations in an image? Yes, that would also be possible. OK, great. OK, further questions? Nope, not at the moment. OK, then, OK, now we had a small overlook, overview of the data set. Um, then for data set comparison, um, here we just split the data set, create two data sets, and then we can put them in the object detection data set comparison. This is basically the overview just run twice where you have the data put next to each other. So as we can see, for example, here, the fractions are basically the same. It's just smaller. And we have all the others. There are some uh, additional GUIs now. Because 
uh, if you want to see relative how the distribution is, you basically look at the color map and can identify each panel with a panel on the other side. If you activate the link plot axis, they will have the same axis. So for example, here now the range scaling is from zero to 44. And this has now the same color bar as the plot on the left hand side. And the same happens for the objects per image overview. And if you unlink them, they will be scaled individually again. For this 2D histogram, it's the same, but each one is scaled individually again. And if you want to compare them, you can just normalize the rows and this will apply to both sides then because they are automatically scaled from one from zero to one. And for the gallery, you can now sort them individually. You basically get everything twice for the comparison at the moment. Oh yeah, one uh, important addition up here. Um, automatically a search for duplicates is done to identify if there's any overlap in the data set. So you know uh, beforehand if there, if you had a leak in your data processing. Any further questions? That's actually a very cool uh, feature there that gives you already the duplicate uh, images. You can detect them beforehand. Okay, so now we have looked at everything. Okay, let's train a model. This is basically the same as in the Ice Vision tutorials. We just train the model. Okay, let's let run for five epochs. And then we will have a look at the results. Um, here we have again the same structure. We create a data set that represents the results and that can then be consumed from a dashboard to display the information. Uh, for the object detection results data set, you can either load it direct directly from the from disk or instantiate it from a data frame, or you can use the output of the predictions and sample losses from the plot top losses function. Here is an example as how you can save it. You can just say, okay, save it to here. And this is then saved here under test data. Here are some more for other scenarios. And loading the data is basically just take the object detection result data set and use the class function load. This will then load the corresponding data set. Now are, we are can... Saving, oh sorry, are, are you saving them as Pico or how are you saving them? Uh, no, at the moment it's... Uh, this should be a CSV file as this is basically just a pandas data frame uh, underneath. Oh, okay. So yeah. It's just a data frame. Oh, right, 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 got it. Okay, so let's, whoa. Okay. 
class map. Thought I run this five minutes ago. Uh, one second. That's the beauty of live demo. Yeah. <laughs> so it says that this doesn't have the entry class record. No problem. Trigger. Maybe you can output Data. the class map and see if it's populated or not. Yes, it is. Uh, this is, uh, okay, I think I know where this comes from. Was one last minute fix I tried to do. Seems like it didn't really fix it. But I can just rebuild it. Okay, then let's try again. Let's just run the whole notebook. Because there was some, or there is still a problem with the propagation of the class map for the gallery in the results overview. Uh, oh, I totally ran the wrong notebook. Okay, so we are training again. Um, there's one thing at the moment um, because Boki is the plotting backend at the moment. There is some performance issue, uh, I, as I will show you in a minute, where the most of the time for displaying a dashboard is consumed by the rendering of bokeh, which is about 86%. Um, okay. But I just, oh, okay, again, my mistake. It's in the results, I display two. Um, galleries where one represents the uh, truth, the ground truth, and the other represents the prediction that it was made. And I forgot to clean up the second one. Okay, so now hopefully everything is all right. Um, maybe while this is running, I can show you a bit how everything works underneath with the data sets. Um, does anyone know what a descriptor is in Python? I don't. Okay, um, you uh, are properties known for classes where you can use the add property decorator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so basically they are pretty or they are somewhat the same or a uh, property is a descriptor, but it's a different implementation. 
and a data set descriptor is basically a class attribute that handles specific specifically over the one set name the get and the set method which need to be implemented and then they have a specific behavior for example this is a string descriptor where if the name is set uh, the private name or let's start here name is set as a string descriptor now when the class is instantiated this attribute will be filled with the string descriptor now whenever the class or a class instance dot name is accessed not the name itself is accessed but the get method is called from the string descriptor and if one wants to set it the set function is called um, this has some handy features for example if we want to have data sets and we want to leave the freedom to the developer of how certain things are represented then we can use a descriptor where in this case all the developer needs to do is to define the calculate description function and everything else is already handled here so if we let's say want to represent the stats of a data set let's see if everything okay this already works so uh, let's say we want the data set stats basically this is just a descriptor in the case here where it dis uh, returns a pandas data frame containing the different information this makes it easy for writing dashboards or adding dashboards manipulating them because often you just have to define a new descriptor and replace the old one and the logic behind stays the same okay so uh, I have to clear the output because else otherwise the rendering would take much longer because if I show or basically this plot is the same elements as shown below which would trigger an update for both if I change one of them okay so for the results dashboards first each loss with a histogram so you can have a look at them individually then you can have a look at uh, i will zoom out one more step okay okay now everything's fine Ah, oh, there we go um where we have a scatter plot where the distributions of each axis can be seen along the axis and we can look at different stats for example let's see how the total loss and the score are dependent oh right because i rendered the dashboards below this one won't activate um yeah that's the problem because Boki needs to build everything and needs to run the server for the layout this always takes a bit of time so let's have a look at the total loss and the score something okay and as we can see here there seems to be 
a slight correlation that where the network isn't so sure about the class, the loss gets bigger, which is to be expected. And you can basically just pick what you want on the X and on the Y axis and just select what you want. Um, for the coloring, you have the label, the number of annotations and the file name. Um, be careful with the file name. If you have a lot of files, basically every image uh, will get its own point in the legend, which can be quite um, uh, quite a lot. So if we, for example, look here at the area and the total loss, there doesn't seem to be a very or a, a direct correlation or anything we can directly see. But each legend is on, uh, you can click it and hide certain classes. So let's say we want to look at the cans and the water bottle. So here we get the distribution. Then on the right hand side, we again have the same plotting structure as seen above. We can again now use the different losses and so on versus label, number of annotations and file name. So um, the next step is the gallery, which wasn't working before. Okay, so the problem is here that the class map isn't propagated correctly, so it shows, it does not show the class name, but the number. Um, that's something I will fix soon. Um, any further questions on this part? Can you uh, please? Nope. Uh, I was just, uh, yeah, wondering if you could uh, go back to this slide actually, and the, uh, okay, oh, this, the, yes, yes. So, the, so this is the the graph on the left. It's the so the uh, x is the uh, the loss, and uh, and the y is the area. Correct. Okay, so. Here we should be able to detect, for example, if the net, the uh, uh, if the model is good at uh, detecting, for example, correctly uh, small objects. I guess. Let's say we have uh, uh, a data set where we have uh, different size of boxes, and we have also small boxes. And if we want to uh, make sure. Uh, if the small boxes are detected correctly, we should be able to see it in this graph, no? Correct. Okay. Yes, or for example, if you, here you can gauge how the uh, number of annotations plays in. Okay, one annotation. Here, but as we can see from this, if we take everything away except the four, see that mm -hmm. most of the images with a higher loss seem to have four objects on it, which might be because if we take a look here and sort, uh, okay, this is only sorted by the loss. Then let's go to the image with the highest loss. Um, this is probably because the objects overlap with each other and uh, hide the other partially, which mm -hmm. might be problematic. For just for example, here, for example, we can see that the head of yeah. the bottle at the bottom is not correctly 
identified. So this is to give us some ideas where the problems might come from. And the next part. What we can see in on that uh, on that graph, we can see that small boxes are have a higher loss, no? Because they are uh, on, yes. on the right uh, bottom corner. Yes. R relatively. But if we take everything, uh, we can see, yeah, you can see that there is maybe a little bit of a downward trend here. But also you have here some data. I mean, there is a trend, but it's only slight. I would say it's only a slight trend. Mm -hmm. So it would be the combination of having like a smaller uh, boxes with uh, the like a multiple object uh, in the same object uh, in the same image. Yes. Okay. Um, to, for the next part, the precision recall overview, uh, I will just jump to the corresponding singular dashboard because every time a plot changes all the layout needs to be recalculated so not only the this tab would be calculated completely from scratch but the other one also and this stacks up and requires quite a lot of time then okay so here we have the mean average precision for all data points so just ap AP small, medium, there aren't any images of that class, so they're both zero. And for AP large, which is basically the same as AP because we only have AP large images. Um, then here we can go to the different overviews for the specific APs. And here we can on top choose the class and then we get the AP score for that class as well as the AP scores at different IOUs. Then we have here the precision recall curves where we have the actual calculation, the, uh, the monotonic version and the AP11. And if you click on the legend, you can always remove them. This is really, really cool. And at the bottom, you also uh, can see the scores versus the recall. So you can see how the score drops with the recall. Or you can hover over it, and then you see the score, the true positives, false positives, and false negatives at that point. Just out of curiosity, like how are you calculating those those charts? Like, is this coming from some uh, show summary equals to no? No, or, or what was that? Like, Coco metric show summary equals to. Uh, I implemented it myself. Um, I can show, or the code lives under in the metrics. Um, a notebook. Here you will find two implementations. One is the AP, uh, which is an abstract base class, which basically defines the structure on how to calculate everything and requires three, uh, two functions. One, preparing the data. Uh, here you can look at how the data has to look. And an abstract method for filtering the data, so how you filter the data for the different APs. Um, basically what this does is it loops over the, or first of here, the image stats. Um, first we filter the data 
oh no, this is image stats. This is not get metric data. Ah, here, get metric data. Basically, what happens is we filter for the different APs, prepare the data, and then we loop over each class and get the corresponding data. Um, if you want to, or this is already a general structure here, for example, this is specifically for the record data sets or for the result data sets. Um, and this uses Shapely to calculate the intersections, but there's also a fast version for object detection where I directly calculate the intersections, which is faster than the Shapely version because everything needs to be converted into a Shapely polygon. Wow, and you implemented all of this yourself? Yes. Huh, I'm wondering if actually we can add this metric on the library itself. Maybe we can take a look at that. This is really amazing. Sure. Yeah, it's really, really amazing. Um, all right, so, and then of course, you can select whoa, uh, the different classes because this is all again bulky in the back end again. Uh, this takes a little bit. Uh, bulky has the advantage of all the interactive stuff, but the drawbacks are the layout calculations, which can take quite some time. I didn't fully take this in con into consideration when I created uh, everything. I mean, Bokeh works great with huge amounts of data in only a few plots, but small amounts of data in a large number of plots is um, not really optimal for performance. Um, so I'm at the moment thinking of maybe changing the backend to matplotlib for some static plots and only using Bokeh for the really interactive or for the interactive plots. So this is basically how you can take a look at your data and use that information for before the training and after the training. Uh, oh, as I see, we are already quite. Okay, it's um, okay. Then just one quick additional example. Um, this is basically the same here. I just load some results, um, display them here. This is for the pets data set. And if we take a look at the score here, we can see that some classes are there, that the model is much more confident about them than about others. Um, in this case, it's only because the model was only trained for five epochs. Um, but let's say this is some real world data, the data is messy, you don't really know everything that is in the data and you just run a model over it to see what sticks. Um, then you can use this overview to identify the classes and the data points that are suitable. Um, for example, um, if we take a look at the, or let's take here a look at the number of annotations um, versus the total loss. We can see that if we normalize the rows, um, here for example, three annotations are uh, seem to be a bit higher, but we only have one value here, so there is something special about that. And it seems as we then find out, it's or there's only one real annotation 
per image or one ground truth and basically everything that shows more than one is already a problem. Um, then let's say, okay, um, that we just want to try something on the data that somewhat works. So for example, we say, okay, which score good on the classification? And we can take four like Pak, um, Shiba Inu, uh, uh, Sphinx and Great Pyrenean here, for example. Um, we would have to manually go through the data set, filter it again and so on. Or we can use the uh, data set generator um, where we again just use a list of records, create uh, the corresponding data set and put this into the object detection data set generator. So here again, the problem with uh, slow updates comes up as you will see, but here, um, so I now selected the Sphinx and this will update all the histograms. So then we want the Great Pyrenees and this takes some time. Um, to cut it short, I already did this. Um, oh yeah, and you can of course um, cut on the um, histograms, for example, like this, and then all the histograms will be updated accordingly. Then you can click on the create button. I have to do it twice now because there's still a small bug that now we get a data set overview for the whole data set down here. And if you click these entries here, um, the overview for the corresponding data set will be generated. Um, one problem with that is it's already, uh, again, a huge amount of plots. We have to redraw each and the solver needs to run again, which again costs us performance. Okay, so if you did that, you can add a name and a description to a data set as well in as, as oh no, I think I, I don't know. Thing good. Um, and then you can just click on export and then every data set in the list here will be exported. For example, here, this is what I created beforehand. And we can just load that. The VBOX record data set also takes a string where the string is a path to the saved object. And here we can have a look at it. And it's basically the four classes we wanted. And we can again, look at everything. Then uh, we can split the records into train and validation records and just run the model with the new data and then again, have a look at the results. So this uh, should give you the possibility to, whoa, did I run out of DRAM? Yes, okay. Uh, I... Okay, um, and then you, this should help you to iterate quickly on uh, on your data sets if you have messy data sets then going through everything by hand
Okay, we can load it. Overlook split train. Yeah, I think this is extremely helpful, by the way, to be able to do this. It's very nice. I hope because, or as often, uh, or I, uh, okay, something is eating up the memory. Well, but then this will train on the new data set and then you can have an overview of that afterwards. Because often I encounter quite, or um, people have really messy data. I mean, the data sets we have for research are really clean. There's a lot of work put into them, but most real world data sets are messy. And yeah, it's just here is a bunch of images. We ourselves don't know what's really in there. So, as now the hour is, we are one hour in, um, I would say question and answer, or do you want to see a bit more from the library internals? A quick question, uh, are you using it in a real project? Uh, uh, not at yet. Work or something? Okay. Uh, not yet, but this uh, will, or uh, but I will in the future. This is really impressive what you built here. Thank you. Yeah, I like it quite a lot as well. Yeah. It covers a lot, actually. Um, it's going to be like a, a golden tool to uh, go and inspect the like the part where it doesn't the, the training. Uh, is not working very well and so on. So very yeah, I agree. It's really outstanding work. So any further questions on anything? I think we are overwhelmed by the, <laughs> the amount of information. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of stuff. <laughs> covered so many, I mean, when you see all the features that you presented here, it's really impressive. So this is not like a, I don't know, a weekend project. You know, no, there is took quite it. some time to get everything done. I had to rewrite it once or twice because there was some things I didn't take into account, but now I think it should be somewhat, or it should be stable, a stable foundation to build upon. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if uh, the you considered uh, plot links. Would you think that they have the same uh, like limitation as uh, Bokeh? Or? Um, I am not sure. Um, for plotting or um, I think more of a problem is really that you um, or I think most of the limitations can be circumvented if for some for example as this plot is already incorporated here I can replace this with just a static plot without any interactions which would mm -hmm reduce the amount of required render time. Yeah. Um, I am not sure if Plotly will be much faster. I think really a static PNG is the simplest solution. And uh, I think for that, Matplotlib would be the best tool of all. Okay, th then you will have like uh, two dependencies. You, you will have mat, uh, matplotlib and and bokeh, I, I guess. Yes, um, okay. of course. Or the um, the panels, uh, the drop downs, and so on. Basically, the uh, interactive components are part of panel, which already relies upon bokeh. So um, Basically, Boki would be a dependency anyway, 
Mm -hmm. And Boki has some nice features. Uh, course, um, what are I in the, or as far as I know, in Plotly, you can't directly get the selected data back or uh, the indices of selected data. Um, this is the controls uh, part of the library where I define control structures as the, um, uh, yeah, the slide ray, uh, sliding ranges and so on. And there's also here, uh, this is a component um, for basically selecting in scatter plots. Um, and with Boki, I can retrieve that information and save it from the plot, which allows me to build quite complex selection systems. Mm -hmm. This would be interesting, for example, if I want to um, merge the results overview with the dataset generator. And let's say there is some interesting uh, spot in the scatter plot, then I would be able to basically select these plots with this tool. And then I can decide how they are combined. Um, and then make my selection from that to generate a new data set. So ba basically you go from uh, like a, a figure or an illustration and you make your selection and you create a new, uh, like a, a JSON file or uh, any a new data set. Yes. That you store on the disk and afterwards you can reload it, parse it and yes. uh, train it again. Yes. Okay. Um, there is here the, or really the cool. data sets. Uh, oh no, this is data. Okay, this is the implementation basically for the object detection and so on. Um, the base level for that is the record data set um, as well as some specific parsers here to parse um, a data frame to a set of records. And what the record data set is capable of is saving the data to disk, loading the back the data frame, and then using the record data frame parser to pass uh, the entries to records so you can directly retrieve the records from the data set. Or you can basically use this to save your selection and load it back up later. So when you say a uh, record data set, this is a record data set that is specific to the uh, dashboard. It's not the yes. same, yes, not yes. The same yes, as yes. the uh, eyes vision. Yes, right, Just Sorry. to make sure that uh, I understand well the like the the flow of the okay so basically you can select from a figure uh, like uh, data points and you can store them in a data frame you store them on the disk then you can reload them from the disk you can parse them uh, with the class that you just uh, show uh, now the previous yes. one and from Using that parser, you're going to uh, reconstruct a, a record set that is specific to the dashboard. Yes. And from there, you can pass it, you can uh, create the Eyes Vision record set and continue with the Eyes Vision uh, like a pipeline to train the, your uh, saved data. Is correct. That correct. Yes, that's what's basically happening in this notebook here. Perfect. Where we first, 
uh, here we take a look at the data set. Here we create the data set. Mm -hmm. And then we load it from disk here. Take another look at it. And then we just call the split in train and val function where we just pass the train split and this will return us the training records and the validation records. And then we can just continue with the regular ice vision pipeline where we just use the training records and the validation records here for the data set creation and subsequently in the data loader creation. Okay. So at uh, the fifth cell there, cell number five, there you are like in Ice Vision land, and just before that you are in the dashboard land. Yes. Okay. Perfect. It's phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, it's really impressive. Yeah, I mean, you you kind of built up and. And, and completely new library, right? On top of on top of Ice Vision. Uh, I mean, not even on top of Ice Vision, but pa on pa in parallel, pretty much. It's um, it's really cool stuff. Thank you. I hope it's really helpful to <laughs> do projects. We we need to train ourselves to be able to to use it like at uh, its full potential. I think because mm -hmm. there are like so many features that you get, that can be used that uh, it will take like a, a kind of a small project where you can go through all the different steps that you showed here with the real data and see how it can be used in, in the real world. If you look at the repo, there is an example folder where the two examples I presented today are already included. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also planning, or I have a little roadmap um, of things I want to do next. For example, the speed ups, as I mentioned before, some code refactoring, um, modal comparison would uh, be nice to have, add some more examples to show more facets of the uh, package. Then add more plots for the result dashboard, for example. A confusion matrix would be interesting, I think. And the AR statistics, so the average recall statistics, as well as integrate new tasks like classification, where you can have a object detection result overview, a classification result overview, and so on. <laughs> That's very impressive. Just out of, out of curiosity, like, is this is this, is this driven by um, work needs or by you know personal interest? Mm, more personal interest of all. Okay. Also, basically, it's a tool I would like to have in any project. So. But I didn't find anything that would give me all these things. So I basically built it myself. That's great. So I guess the, the best thing to, if you want to use it, is to just in, install from master or, uh, or do you have like a, a um, hi fi? Uh, Repo, there is a or... release, but uh, it's a bit outdated. I can mm -hmm. make a new release uh, later. Okay. I think that would be great in the sense that, especially if you are considering uh, refactoring parts, that would be good to have like a, a version that we can pin and then you can uh, try it out there while you are making the the, the different uh, refactoring yes i really really enjoyed this um I, I, i'm mind blown uh, uh, really so uh thank you so much for your time i i i, I you guys go ahead i didn't want to interrupt just, just say bye
Thank you too.